Um, okay. So is that Burr <laughs> in 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 binary? Possibly. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So today we're 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 doing a refresher on communications protocols, which we talked about last quarter. Um, shouldn't be too difficult. You guys kind of went over it. And then after the second half is going to be mainly on. Uh, it's going to be about the coming labs, um, which I will talk about. And uh, it will be kind of worked example, get you guys started. If we, I didn't go over this, it would probably take a long time for you to finish the lab. So, um, so thanks for coming, because this will definitely help you guys a lot. Uh, it's very directly related to the lab. So in terms of announcements, you guys should know design reviews are happening. Um, and then this is just the last push. Once, once the design reviews are done, and we aim to have the design reviews this week, and then have you guys finalize everything by next week, um, th then we're going to just order the PCPs and like whatever they are set in stone. So you guys will just get those and get to work on like the, the real hardware and, and the software for it. Um, so in terms of the timeline, just to make it transparent, uh, we're going to have obviously design reviews this week. And me and Aaron this weekend, along with some other IEEE officers, will put together boxes. And we'll ship uh, things out to you guys for um, the next two labs. Or it's kind of one lab that's just combined and uh, separated into two. Um, and we'll be shipping early next week. Uh, and the lab will be posted this weekend, possibly maybe around Monday or next Monday or Tuesday, because I know both like Aaron has like six things to do this Sunday, and I have like three big things to do on Monday. So possibly after that. Um, but you guys won't need to touch on the lab until after your boards are completed and your things have arrived. Um, so week five is when we're going to ask you guys to make the changes um, for teams that need it, who, who still have a lot of problems with the board. We'll have a second round of design reviews um, that uh, only maybe me, one or of me or Aaron has to go uh, be there for it. And then the final board will be due on Friday, and then we'll be ordering PCBs during that weekend. Um, and then after that, we'll have lecture six, and we'll be moving on to some theoretical stuff. Some of the things we'll be talking about today are basically directly related to the labs that come after week six. Um, and we could have delayed that as well, but uh, we wanted to just spread out the lectures for you guys. So um, you'll probably revisit this recording a few times um, in the future, or once or twice, maybe. Isn't this still your part? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. I thought we were from here, right? Oh. Ah, OK, well, yeah, so we're basically reviewing um, what we talked about before about communications protocols. You guys have already implemented I squared C and SPI into your system, uh, into your, uh, your board. But we're going to talk a little about, about what the theory and wires are kind of doing. And hopefully also help you with your wiring and knowing what's happening. Um, but yeah. Wait, is this my part? Wait, yes. <laughs> wait, wait. Wait, 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 which part are you starting real quick? I'm <laughs> starting out on communications protocols. <laughs> okay, 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 great. Okay, sure. Um, uh, wait, where's the, where, how do I play? Presents okay. on the right. Yeah. <laughs> My cat was blocking it. Okay, great. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're so right now again, we're talking about information. The reason we're talking about information is in order for us to communicate between two uh, modules or, or two things like your MCU and your IMU, um, typically, they'll have some information stored in their memory, and we're trying to extract that memory from these locations. So it's a word that you'll hear here a lot starting now is the term registers, and it is basically a circuit made of these things called flip-flops. And flip-flops will hold, um, well, flip-flops each hold one bit of memory, so it's either a high or low, and that can be interpreted as a digital like zero or one. Uh, and then registers will hold a series of eight of it because one byte is eight bits, and um, 8 bits uh, is like the unit that people use in computing. So, um, so when we obviously we have the MCU and the IMU, I'm just going to say IMU from here on for I squared C. Uh, they're going to be connected together, and we've seen that with the two data lines. Uh, and then you you're going to the MCU will basically have to command the, the IMU that it's trying to read some data from it. And then the IMU will send data back to the MCU. And that's kind of what the IMU's job is. And then the MCU gets the data, and you can do whatever you want with it, which we'll talk about in the future. Um, and then writing is uh, very similar. It, uh, the MCU will tell the, the IMU where to write data to, so which register to write to. And we'll go over a worked example during this lecture um, that will hopefully make this abstraction more clear. But 
we talked about this before, so we'll just move on. Um, so what, why do we need communication protocols? Uh, obviously, we're just communicating with high and low voltage. So in order for us to actually interpret this data, we have to have a set of rules uh, to determine what everything means uh, in, in, on a hardware level. Um, and then it allows us for, to have multiple devices communicate with each other as we've implemented. Oh, Aaron, we can't hear you. Well, I can't hear you. I'm muted. I'm not trolling. <laughs> I'm into. You. Okay. Yeah. So first, we'll go over like a brief overview of, I guess, the primary properties of uh, of communications protocols. So first, we'll go over like uh, the difference between serial and parallel. So <laughs> yes, inting block. <laughs> so yeah. So an example of parallel is on the left where multiple like essentially bits of information can be sent over at the same time in a, I guess you can call it a parallel manner. And um, as you can see in the example on the left, it's uh, the, the signals are unified by like a clock signal, right? And then on the right is serial where uh, information is sent over in a, in a stream or packet of information and it's like bit by bit one after another instead of multiple bits at once. And then that brings us to synchronous versus asynchronous. So in synchronous, like the ones, uh, like the previous two examples, there is a timing signal or a clock signal shared between the devices, which allows devices to update and uh, transfer register data at the same time. And on the other hand, there's asynchronous where there's like no timing signal between devices. So there's like no explicit uh, like bit, like it'll, you'll see later about like how there's acknowledge bits or like parity bits to mark like the start or end of the transfer of information. So asynchronous actually requires additional setup in order to function properly. And um, so the exa example on the bottom left is uh, a, Oh, bottom left is uh, asynchronous, and then the uh, bottom right is synchronous. And then that brings us to data transfer rate, which is actually something that you have to pay attention to when you're uh, designing your, uh, I guess, like s component selection. You have to make sure that uh, your data transfer frequency or baud rates are actually compatible with another. And there's two. Uh, I guess, uh, two terms that are often thrown around. So there's clock frequency, which is measured in Hertz. Uh, you might recall like for like processors, like CPUs or our uh, MCU, it's processing speed is measured in like a clock frequency, which is uh, in Hertz. And the same thing with like our, uh, our oscillator. We use like an eight mega, some teams use an eight megahertz oscillator to uh, generate a clock signal for our MCU. And the other one is baud rate, which stands for bits per second, which is typically used for asynchronous since there's no uniform clock between the two devices to, uh, synchronize, the, uh, to synchronize the signals. So synchronize the transfer of information. So you instead measure like the, tr the transfer rate per bit instead of uh, a constant transfer rate, like a clock frequency. And next we have uh, like terminology for master versus slave devices. And it's relatively self-explanatory. It just describes uh, what the role is of a specific device with respect to its uh, role in the transfer of data. So master, it sends read or write requests to another device while slaves receive read or write requests from a master telling it what to do. So first we'll talk about UART and it's uh, I guess just two wires for two devices. Neither are master nor slave. You just have TX for one, which stands for, which is like the outgoing data line. And then RX is the incoming data line. And some characteristics are that it's serial. Um, it's asynchronous, which means that you actually, this is where the baud rates come in. And you actually have to match your baud rates between the two devices or else you'll get a lot of uh, bit like transmission errors. And usually you see baud rates of around 9,600 to like around 120,000 baud's. Um, and both systems can receive, uh, can receive and send data at the same time in both directions. 
So neither uh, device is a master or slave, as I mentioned earlier. And it's one additional thing is that it's duplex. So transmission can occur at the same time in both directions. And so an example of uh, UART communication is shown on the right, where at first the, uh, the transmitting, you, you'll transmit a, a start bit. So it'll pull the line from high to low. And then uh, you'll get the eight bits of information, bits zero through seven. And because of uh, our determined baud rate, each bit lasts a constant amount of time. So in this example, it's like 0.1 microseconds. And depending on your setup, you might include a, there might be a parity bit included for uh, error checking. And then once the data is transmitted and the parity bit is received, then there's a stop bit, which pulls the line from low to high and then communication ends. So here uh, the time per bit is 0.1 microseconds, which converts into about 10 million baud. And next we have SPI. So SPI, you have three plus N wires, as you guys might recall from, uh, I guess, the routing traces on your PCBs thus far. You have your S clock, so it's the clock signal shared between all the devices. Uh, you have master out slave in MOSI, master in slave out MISO, and slave select. So the clock, MOSI, and MISO are like the three wires, and then you need a, an additional like slave select for every single additional uh, slave device that the master, or in our case, the MCU addresses individually. And um, some characteristics, uh, SPI is serial and synchronous. So it has that clock signal that it shares with all the other devices. And data transmit rates, this time, it because it's synchronous, it's easy to measure. So it's in the, uh, uh, it has a clock frequency of within the megahertz range. And uh, one, you have one master and it can control multiple slaves at once. And uh, you can connect as many devices as you want and it's also duplex. So it can transmit in both directions at the same time between devices. Oh, I know we get, we're going a little fast because this is mostly review. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just type in the chat or unmute. Uh, yeah, just interrupt us if you have any questions. And yeah, so this is gonna, you might recall this example from the previous lecture. So um, in this example, you have the master pull slave select low for the desired device. And then it'll start oscillating the clock um, between high and low at the specified clock frequency. And then master begins outputting data across the MOSI line. And uh, if, the if the slave is also outputting data, then it'll do so over the MISO line. And then once the communication, uh, once the information is transmitted and communication ends, then master releases the slave select signal back to high. And uh, if, if you recall from last lecture, we discussed what polarity is and phase. So polarity uh, just defines uh, whether or not you're pulling it high or low. And then phase, it determines whether or not you're, whether you're measuring the bits of in information on the leading edge. So when it rises or trailing edge, when it falls. So next we have I2C, inter-integrated circuits. Uh, so this is two wires for as many devices as you want. And SDA handles all of the data transfer and SCL is the clock signal shared across all devices. So you can have multiple slaves and multiple masters across these like two wires. And um, overview of the characteristics, it's a serial communications protocol. So it's uh, one bit after another. Synchronous, since it has that SCL signal that's shared across all of its devices. And it's significantly slower than SPI um, because of the pull-up resistors that we have to use. So because of the open drain protocol. So its data transmission rate is around 100 to 400 kilohertz normally. And you can have one or more master devices control one or more slaves. So you can actually have multiple uh, multiple masters like connected to the same two wires and then they can communicate with one another uh, using like address by communicating each other by addressing each other by their specific device address. Oh yeah. Okay, and also it's half duplex, so it can only like transfer information in one direction at once, not in both. But yeah, so um, I'll go over like the specific uh, types of bits 
uh, in the uh, I2C protocol. And then Eric will go over an example. So first let's start with the uh, start or S bit and address bits. So the start bit occurs and it's highlighted in red in the example when SDA is pulled low, since we have that pull-up resistor constantly pulling it to a higher voltage and then uh, followed by it being pulled back down, followed by the clock signal being pulled low. And this, this uh, interaction essentially tells all devices connected to those two SDA and SCL lines that communication is about to begin. And following that, the uh, master outputs a uh, address. So it's a seven bit address that, rep rep that represents the desired device that it wants to communicate with. Communicate with. It, it represents their unique address along the SDA and SCL lines. And that's highlighted in blue. And following that, we have the read and write bit. So this indicates whether the master is going to receive or send data. And that's highlighted in red. So it'll, and that's followed usually by an acknowledge bit or ACK bit. Once the address bit and the read write bits are received, then the uh, slave device outputs an acknowledge bit. And in this case, the uh, master will release SDA high and the slave will pull SDA low. And that's essentially what the acknowledge is. This tells the master that the, that the uh, slave has acknowledged that uh, it's either it's ready to either read or write data. And lastly, we have the data itself and the stop bit or P, which also stands for parity. But yeah, so with regards to the data, after the acknowledge is accepted, the master outputs its data over the data line SDA one byte at a time, followed by an acknowledge. And the interesting thing about uh, I2C is that you can actually uh, send multiple bytes of data at once, depending on your configuration. It'd just be like your one byte of data followed by acknowledge, acknowledge, and then another byte of data followed by another acknowledge until that stop bit is sent. And so with regards to the stop bit, data transmission officially ends with a stop bit, and it can only happen after like a full data cycle. So after a full byte of data is sent, SCL is released high, and then SDA is also released high shortly after. And then after both are high, then all devices know that transmission ends and now they're just awaiting a new start bit. And that's highlighted in blue. All right, so we're gonna go over uh, kind of an example. Um, this is, okay, so this is taken directly from the uh, uh, IMU's data sheet. By the way, if you guys like didn't listen to that previous part, like I, I highly recommend you guys very uh, like, focus high on this part because this is kind of like, I'd say like 70 to 80% of the answer for the next lab. <laughs> so um, uh, I will be asking for a little bit of participation. You can just type in the chat because uh, you definitely need to like think this through and let it process in your head. So this is taken directly from the data sheet. And this is basically saying what a communication looks like, right? Like Aaron said, we start with this start bit and then we have the address plus write. And remember what this address is? This address is tell, because in I2C we have multiple devices on the same line, right? So this address is saying, which device are we talking about? For example, the, I, the uh, IMU has like a specific kind of like identification, which is, I, I have a number in a later slide, but it's that. Then that'll be a seven bit address. And the last bit of the byte uh, is a write or read bit. Um, so this isn't a write sequence, it will be a write bit. Um, in our case, write is zero and that's on the data sheet. Uh, slaves is an acknowledge, this the slave will do on its own. You don't need to code this because we are only coding the master, which is M the I, uh, MCU. Then um, when it sees the acknowledge bit, uh, the master will write a register address and that's what RA is. And what that means is we'll, we'll kind of go over why we would want to write to certain registers later on, uh, like right after this, but that's basically saying where in the IMU are you going to write data to? And then obviously right after that is the data you wanna to write to the re uh, register. Uh, does it make sense? Um, and then, and then when you acknowledge it here, potentially you can keep writing into later registers. So let's say your register address is like 10, you write eight bits of data, or sorry, one byte of data, then, and you want to keep writing into like 11 and 12, you can just keep adding data and it'll just write over the addre uh, addresses. And that's something that some uh, modules are able to do. And for us, we are able to do. Um, so 
This is a table directly from the data sheet, page 36. Later on, when you're looking for the information we just talked about, you want to go to that page and you have all the information on what your write sequence will look like and what your uh, what all these things basically mean. Um, so let's just go over a high level overview of what our second step of uh, what, what our lab is doing. And it's uh, this is the second step, step specifically because I'm trying to show one example of where we want to write a register. And we're going to be talking about accelerometers, right? Because that's one of the things we're using in IMU. So does anyone know like how we use the accelerometer to, kind of, to help our drone fly? You can just type something in the chat or unmute. I don't really mind. Yes, exactly. And you has got it. Helps us measure the angle. And we'll go over more in sensor fusion of why we specifically choose uh, accelerometers are very good at this. Um, one of the reasons is kind of no matter how you move your accelerometer around, eventually, if you put it flat, um, the, the, the direction of like up or down is uh, stationary relative to uh, the, the device. So um, the question, though, is I'll ask you again, Yudin, um, is this is kind of a hard question, which is, let's say your, your accelerometer is at rest. Do you think that the acceleration will point up or down? So that's what most people think. And that's like the intuitive answer. When you actually think about the physics, it points up. And the way you can think about it is the accelerometers detect acceleration relative to the frame of reference of free fall. What that means is, um, let, so you have kind of, let's say something in your, uh, in your module and you have like your box, which is what your accelerometer, uh, your IMU is, which is holding like something that's measuring like an inertial piece. Um, let's say you have an, like an elevator and a person in it. If you're both going at free, uh, 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 at free fall, they're in the same inertial reference frame. So um, you, uh, it won't experience any acceleration. But if you are like the person and, uh, you, uh, rel and you're like free falling and you see the elevator stop, you actually see an acceleration upwards. So uh, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of a high level overview, but um, it's not too important for today. Uh, but if you guys have questions later on, you guys can ask during our uh, lab hours or when we do check offs. The point is, though, that yes, we can measure angle. That was kind of a, a, a sidetrack thing. But if we tilt it, we can see the angle relative to it, right? And when we realize this, uh, so does anyone know like what the values here would be? So like your x value, your y value, and your z value. What numbers should you be expecting? And this is, I'm saying like when your drone is hovering, so like not moving, we're simplifying that. And it's like facing upright, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So we would get uh, 0, 0, and then 1G. And normally, in terms of accelerometers, because it's often used in this application, they measure in units of G. So yes, 9.8, pretty much. So here we have the question, right? So with our accelerometers, we obviously want the most accurate data in terms of our resolution. And you know how digital data is all stored in like an, an integer. And that only has a certain like resolution for how many numbers you can represent, right? So if you're trying to represent, you have like five bits and you try to represent a number from like zero to one versus a number from zero to 100, your zero to one will have a much more fine grain increment. So you'll be more accurate. So let's go to an example in our lab. And this is kind of going into why we want to write into registers. Um, this, uh, so let's, I'm, I'm going to go over the data sheet because I know data sheets are always like something people ask about and have struggled with. So, um, I'm kind of walking through how this goes. So this, this is a thing called a register map and it's saying what all the registers mean within that, the IMU. And let's just go to register, register descriptions here. It's very long, but on the very early on, we see accelerometer configuration, right? And you'll see this tabled in this on page 15 here. And it says you have these ranges that you can uh, set your accelerometer to. Do you guys have an idea of which one we would want to do here? So this is the range of values that your accelerometer can view. And you can preset it to say like either negative 2 to 2 or negative 16 to 16 or whatnot. Yeah. 
the maximum power. <laughs> that is exactly the wrong answer, David. <laughs> but I appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, so, because we're only expecting values from negative two to two G, right? Uh, sorry, from negative G to G. Well, I mean, you're, hopefully your drone doesn't flip around, so it's actually like zero to G. Uh, so we would actually want the smallest range, because remember, if we have a certain number of bits for it, a smaller range means that each increment is smaller, and we have a more precise measurement of our data. So we'd actually want to configure it to 2G. But notice that, obviously, when the manufacturer makes this, they give you all these options, because you might use the accelerometer for something else. Like, let's say you're measuring the accelerometer of like the horizontal acceleration of the car or something, right? Um, might be a 16. So you have a basically in the IMU, it has a register that stores the data for what you want to configure it to. And this is pretty much all the information you'll need for this part of the lab. And you basically repeat this for a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of um, different things that you want to configure. Uh, so here we have it says the register we're looking at. And this is under like page 15 uh, here. Here's a register we're looking at, and this stores the data of your configuration. Um, this is just a decimal number because 1c is equal to 28. Um, and you have these three, which are self-test bits. Um, this is kind of a separate thing. Self-test is where within the IMU, they have this actuator that can exert like a force, and that will help you kind of test your IMU without actually having to move it and have other factors. Um, but we want these to be off in our case for now, uh, for this part, because we're trying to actually sense the environments force on it. Um, so let's just say, so we want these to be to be zero, right? And then this is uh, the AFS select. And this is the accelerometer full scale range. Um, and can someone tell me what we would want to set these bits as? Yeah, exactly. So we want to set this as zero. So it's a number from zero to three, or like, so it'll be, yeah, zero, zero. Last three bits, uh, there's a paragraph in it that talks about whenever you see this, this means that they're reserved bits, which we'll deal with later. But for now, we can just write, like, uh, we can just ignore it for now. Um, yeah. So what, as the MC, MP, MCU's perspective, because that's what we're coding from, right? What do we want to write to the IMU? Um, from the data sheet, we see, this is our, just a reminder from the data sheet. This is the statement that we want to write. Okay, the slave address is written on the data sheet as well for your MPU, uh, 6050, and it's uh, this B just represents. It says it's saying binary, so you don't interpret this as like a hundred thousand or uh, 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 one million or something. Um, so it would be one one zero one one uh, one zero zero X, and that's seven bits long. And the uh. The least significant bit of this seven bit sequence is determined by a logic uh, level on one of the pins. And that allows your, uh, basically, being able to change the slave address allows you to connect multiple of the same device onto I squared C bus. So sometimes you would want that. Um, all right. And then here's a reminder of what we're looking at. We talked about how this is the register address, this is the 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 self-test which we want is zero. This is also zero. And it just happens to be zero for this one. In other cases, you will have numbers that you want to configure not to zero. Um, but yes. So what should you be writing? And oh yeah, I was supposed to take the answer off because, but oops. Uh, wait, I can't see the answer anymore because I have this thing blocking it. I have to like not move my mouse. But you see below that you have the answer, yeah. Uh, so the first seven bits, as you see ab uh, above, are uh, the address of the MPU 6050, which I, I wrote there. The last bit is what you're trying to ask it to do. So read or write. Then you have another, uh, you wait for the acknowledge, and you have another sequence, which is the register address. In this case, it's 1C. And 1C in hex, like 1 is written in four bits, and C is written in four bits, because each he hex is four bits, if that makes sense. Um, so this is 28 in, in binary that I wrote. 
uh, in this section. And the last part, we just put the zeros that we found that we want to put in. And then we have these three bits at the end, right? So how do we deal with these reserved bits? Um, a lot, you don't actually want to change these bits because sometimes they're preset and they don't want undefined behavior. Um, so the way that we go about writing into the register without um, changing these bits is by first reading the register, modifying your the bits so that the the bits you don't want to be changed stay the same, but you write you write over the other bits and then you write that back onto the register of the IMU. So for us, let's say we're, we want to first read what is there. Okay, what then what you want to do if you're familiar with digital logic, you want to bitwise and with uh, this number. And for those, if you don't know, and is just, um, it's one when they're both one and zero when it's both zero. What anding does is it creates a mask so that zero and anything is zero. And then um, oh, one and every, anything is whatever the other number is. So one and one is one, one and zero is zero. Uh, so that's just, this is just a, a specific example. You'll sometimes have to do, do a little bit of like finesse to, fix, to make it work with other things. Um, and then, so let's say this is what is in the register and we do a write see a read sequence and we do this. And then when we write to the register, this number here, which ends up being this. And you see that through this process, we preserve the last three bits. So lastly, the question here is how do we actually implement this? So I don't want you guys going back and writing like individual bits back into it because there's with I squared C, there's a whole bunch of other, um, let's just say, nuanced protocols like there there's some timing things where like the slave can choose to hold the line low and stuff like that that we don't want to deal with so the uh stm32 has this thing called the hardware abstraction oh i don't know why i said library it's actually layer uh but it's hardware abstraction layer and we'll talk more about it on the next lecture when we're coding and also in the in the tutorial for cube ide uh but what this does is it takes kind of what we've been talking about this like very detailed hardware side of things and abstracts it to, uh, actually no, the, it, it takes the very detailed hardware like implementation and it abstracts it to what we understand, which is what we talked about during this lecture. So here's the function they use that you can find in the, the HAL documentation. And then it's uh, I squared C master transmit because you're transmitting as a master and it has these four, no, sorry, five variables, okay. The ones I wanna look at first is this h i squared c. This is the reason why we told you guys so many times in the beginning, choose the right pins, choose pins that have i squared c, because they are able to configure channels. Um, they have like a, a how like in, initiation kind of, uh, uh, initiate uh, function as well. And this will be a pointer to a structure that has configured all your pins into i squared c, so you don't have to deal with the individual lines, because that would just be near impossible to start from scratch. Then you want the device ad address, which we talked about. It would be your IMU's address, your data, the, uh, the size. Um, um, wait, is this the device address? Data. Wait, oh, wait, this might. Which one? Wait, wait where's the register address? I might have chosen taken the wrong, the wrong function. Master transmit. Okay, let me shift through that. I will update that later, but there, there is one where you write it to a specific device's address and then also it's register address. And then you have the data and you have the size for data and timeout. Um, I don't know why someone does not have it, but I, I'll change that in the future. And you, I use the right one on the key by tutorial, so that'll be fine. Um, and this is it basically. So all everything we've done kind of accumulates into this. But knowing how what the hardware does is important, right? Because for example, one huge improvement you can make is every time you take data uh, from your IMU, you'll have like Excel accelerometer data. You'll have like an X, Y, Z value. They're actually conveniently placed in addresses that are directly next to each other. So instead of having to write every single time, like uh, let me just go back a bit. Instead of every single time having to write the, the address, the register address, and then data, instead, you can just effectively almost three times your transmission rate just by writing the address, the register address, and keep reading data through. 
and that's what this um, si uh, size variable kind of does. It, it allows you to, it's called burst reading, um, a burst, a burst reading and burst writing. Uh, allows you to um, basically read the uh, like a, a larger amount of data um, when they're next to each other, and it improves your communication communication rate by a few times. So yeah, that's it. Um, so yeah, in terms of summary uh, for what all the communications we're using are, um, here's just a fancy schmancy table. Did you make this table, Aaron? Yes, I pulled it from, I think last year's slide. Ah, yeah. yeah. So this is a, a fancy table on the differences between your communications. For right now, we're, uh, your first lab, we're gonna focus mostly on I squared C. And you are you are you're going to use to talk to your computer, and I squared C you use to talk to your uh, your um, IMU. And yeah, that that's it. Uh, just in terms of any questions on any of this. Nope, we're good. Guess not. Oh wait, my I suddenly remembered actually. I'm dumb, actually. Yeah, you'll be re Yeah, fair. I suddenly remembered actually. I I remember why this is this doesn't have a register address variable. What you actually do to when you use this is you create a data. So you have a pointer to a data buffer. If you guys took CS, you should know that um, you'll basically have a location in memory, and that'll be holding whatever data you have. Um, and you'll take your pointer to your data buffer, and your first byte in that data is actually a register address. That's that's my bad. That, that's the reason why there is no register address variable. So it's just treating this section here, register address and data, as a single piece of data. Because sometimes I squared C doesn't actually use registers. They use like first and first out policies and stuff like that to make things faster. But um, yeah, so it, it gives you that flexibility. But so that's why just don't be confused when you are actually writing this. You write your red. You combine your register and your data ad address, and then your data together, and then make the size, for example, equal to two. That's just yeah. That's how you do it. I remember. Cool. Yeah, definitely. You will probably end up rewatching this. I just hope that um, kind of sits with you a little bit. But when you actually, because it'll still be like two weeks or a week and a half until we get to this lab. So. Uh, so we just yeah. want to do a quick review. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully this walkthrough will help a lot when you guys actually write it. But yeah. Uh, I have a question about the accelerometer. I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. it's like standard for it to be measuring acceleration with respect to free fall. Like I, I feel like it's kind of weird to not be with respect to zero. Right? Yeah, so mm, it's not a, a design choice. It's a physics phenomenon okay so let here one way to think about how accelerometer works is the way it kind of works think of like uh, sadly i can't draw or anything but think Springs. of like an elevator okay yeah. or, oh, or like oh, a box i'm tripping i just realized you already went over this and it made complete sense okay yeah <laughs> one thing i kind of want to talk okay. about is like imagine you have a box if you're interested if you're not interested it's fine but you have a box and let's say you have like a bunch of springs or something connecting a ball in the center of the box and it's like hovering in the center, right? If you were to accel accelerate to the right, you would imagine the ball would, because it's inertial, it would, relative to the box, you move to the left, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So then, but then we would say that that acceleration is to the right. We would never say that acceleration is to the left, right? But if you, um, so, kind of, but then if you had like gravity uh, pulling the ball down relative to the box, it actually looks as if the box is accelerating upwards. So the, the, the actual frame of reference means this ball in free fall, what is the box's acceleration relative to the ball? And that's just because the way accelerometers work actually is just physical proximity. You have like these capacitors um, kind of, uh, that's like the easy way to think of it. That as a literal thing like moves, it'll get closer and you can detect that electrically. Um, yeah. But yeah. What we'll go over in this in the next lecture too. Yeah. In much more detail.
Yeah, and like the effects of it that might have on like sensor data. Yeah, but yeah, that's just like a theoretical thing. I hope that helps. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, well, if you don't have questions, I guess, yeah, just this week is just focused on PCB. Um, don't worry too much about the this coming lab after the PCB. We will announce that more on that because I, uh, it's just kind of awkward timing. Um, and we'll try and keep you guys posted, but just for now, just focus on getting the PCBs done. And when you're done, like that's it, that's it, that's, that's you're just done. Um, and expect announcements about the next lab around where you would uh, turn in your final PCB. And that we'll will also, be covering the information we talked about today. We'll also be shipping out parts to you guys soon, as Eric mentioned earlier, we're, we'll yes. be assembling boxes for you guys with all your parts from yeah. your bomb. And expect to get them like mid to early next week. Yeah. Or maybe late, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Sometime in the next two weeks. <laughs> Or next, well, yeah, like this week, uh, sorry, wait, next week, right? It should be next week, hopefully. Next oh, week. yeah, hopefully sometime. Yeah. Sometime next week, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, I'll see coming. most of you guys on, um, I think actually all of you guys are day after. Um, but in the next two days, I'll see you guys for that. So thanks for coming. Um, hope that this was helpful. But yeah. All right, see you guys. Bye-bye. See ya.